Before heading home, the three of them decided to stop by a hot pot restaurant. Little Zero was eating so heartily that her face was covered in oil, all the while complaining about Roland being cheap and only ordering the cheap stuff. Phyllis, on the other hand, was enjoying everything on the table, even daring to drink the spicy oil broth, which startled the waiter. Later in the night, they finally made their way home, Phyllis suddenly noticed a figure standing in the shadows. Upon closer look, it was Garcia. Roland immediately knew he messed up, Garcia must have been waiting for him ever since he had hung up the phone on her. Standing in the corridor with an icy expression on her face, however, she didn't speak as if waiting for Roland to explain. It was Roland who awkwardly pointed at Phyllis, saying he was just taking care of a relative just like what he said on the phone. Garcia, on the other hand seemingly unbothered, simply told Roland it was time to talk, and she then forcefully grabbed Roland's hand, dragging him away. Seeing this, Phyllis intervened, clearly not happy with Garcia's brusque demeanor, and even began telling her that Roland was the master of this world. However, Roland quickly covered her mouth before she could finish her sentence, leaving Garcia looking puzzled. Roland then urged Phyllis and Zero to go back inside first and promised he would return soon. Reflecting on what he did, Roland felt a bit guilty for ghosting Garcia and for making a poor excuse over the phone, anyone would been upset by this. Soon, he arrived at Garcia's door, seeing it was Roland, she closed the door and pinned him against it. With a smirk, she asked if Roland had made up his mind, or if everything was just an excuse. Roland, nonchalantly breaking free from her grasp, walked towards the couch. Garcia, still looking quite upset, questioned whether Roland no longer wished to join their association. Sitting down, Roland asked for water, preferably with ice. Garcia's eyes flashed with anger as she went to pour him a glass of iced water. While drinking the water, Roland then calmly mentioned the increasing reports of the fallen, noting he had encountered one during his lunch earlier today. He asked if the association was facing any trouble. Garcia, realizing Roland had been near the park, knew exactly what he was talking about, turned out, earlier today, the incident prompted her and several martial fighters to rush to the scene. However, by the time they arrived, the fallen were already dead, and their magical core was missing. Hearing this, while pretending ignorance, Roland asked who it was and who killed it. Garcia shook her head, indicating the question was off-limits as it involved the association's secrets. Nonetheless, Roland was on point, as the association was indeed experiencing difficulties as external corruption was accelerating, leading them towards an impending crisis. Hearing the word external corruption made Roland furrow his brows, and he pressed on to ask her to elaborate. However, Garcia let out a sigh, admitting that she didn't know either, or perhaps that no one did. It could be the end of the world or it might result in everyone turning into monsters. However, she earnestly explained that it was precisely because of this uncertainty that the association needed more people to stand up against external corruption. She argued that it was the responsibility of everyone who had awakened power. Garcia's tone rose slightly as she became more impassioned, saying even if there might be sacrifices in battle, that it was a martial fighter's sacred duty. She understood why Roland might be concerned, but stressed that if every martial fighter hesitated or feared, then no one would be left to protect the people. Garcia's candidness took Roland by surprise, yet it was also apparent why she struggled to recruit more members. Roland didn't immediately respond, instead, his thoughts drifted to the Red Moon. Initially, he had wanted to join the association for the fat paycheck, but it now seemed the situation was far more complex than that. He felt it might be necessary to leverage the strength of the Martial Fighter Association to uncover the truths of this world. After a prolonged silence, Garcia couldn't help but press Roland for an answer. Snapped out of his reverie, Roland casually mentioned that he would join. Hearing this, caught Garcia off guard, she was both happy and surprised. Nonetheless, from that moment on, Roland was officially a member of their association. Returning home, Roland explained to Phyllis about Garcia's identity and why she was important. He advised Phyllis not to take others' attitudes to heart, as in this world no one knew his true identity. Phyllis still seemed a bit troubled, but Roland had fulfilled her request, allowing her to experience being a human again, earning her genuine respect. This was the reason why she was displeased with others' lack of respect towards Roland, especially since this was the world he had created. 
Roland, with a smile, clarified that the inhabitants of this world had their own complete memories and thoughts, independent of Roland, and the world itself operated on its own rules. Hearing this, Phyllis's eyes sparkled up. She leaned in and whispered, asking if this was the world where Roland had previously lived, perhaps already suspecting the Prince of Grey Castle was just a facade. Roland was taken aback by how she figured out, momentarily at a loss for words. He tried to remain composed and asked why she would think that, though internally, he was becoming gradually more anxious. Phyllis Blinkton explained that it was because of the city of Neverwinter, the very city that Roland created, which was designed in a similar manner to this world. She had been confused as to why Roland planning to build a city like that, until she saw cars on the road earlier today, realizing the roads weren't meant for carriages rather it was for cars. The tall buildings, machines, and powerful weapons all seemed to tie back to this world. Roland pondered for a moment before deciding to keep the secret about him getting Isekai'd into this world. He explained that he was the real fourth prince, but that he had suddenly acquired additional memories, however, he only managed to possess a small portion of this profound knowledge. He hoped this could convince Phyllis, as for his deepest secrets, he wished to share them only with those closest to him. Phyllis seemed not to doubt his words in the slightest, even considering the memories a divine gift to Roland by the gods, perhaps Roland was truly the chosen one. She firmly believed that with Roland by their side, they could surely defeat the demons. Roland was surprised that she suddenly became so confident, given that all they had done was go out for the day. Phyllis tells him that it is all because of the cars. In the Takira days, they needed a plethora of horses and carriages to transport military supplies to the front lines, which limited their reach. However, their enemies had a better logistical capability. Phyllis's assessment of strength based on transportation capabilities intrigued Roland. She elaborated that the cars and trucks they saw today could achieve what Takira could only dream of, and coupled with powerful weapons, they were sure to defeat the demons. Roland was impressed by the Takira witch's keen insight. The fact that she could deduce so much from just observing crowded buses and trucks proved just how smart they were. In the end, Phyllis stood up, she bowed deeply, and despite Roland not being a witch or capable of wielding the instrument, she believed he was the chosen one bestowed by the gods. Roland was happy to see that he could finally fully integrate the Takira witch into Neverwinter and this would be very beneficial for future developments. As the day came to an end, it was time to return to the real world. Roland placed a ladder in front of the bed, and Phyllis climbed up step by step. Looking out at the world outside the window, she lingered for a moment but quickly recognized that it wasn't her world. She closed her eyes and let herself fall from the ladder back onto the bed, however nothing happened. It seemed that only when Roland left this world could Phyllis possibly leave as well. As Roland climbed the ladder, Phyllis approached him, having already guessed that there were two possibilities, either she would return to the original world with Roland, or she would be trapped here forever. Regardless, she expressed her hope that Roland to not worry about her. She would always cherish the memories of everything that happened that day. Roland nodded, then let himself fall backward. The next moment, he felt the weight of Anna's head resting peacefully on his arm, her lips curled into a slight smile as if she were dreaming something pleasant. Carefully, Roland extracted his arm without waking her, covered her with the blanket, and quietly left the room. Walking down the stairs, the soldiers who saw him all stood at attention, but Roland gestured for them to relax and proceeded to the main hall alone. There, he found Phyllis, who seemed a bit dejected but managed to muster a slight smile, looking at Roland she quietly said her dream had ended. Perhaps the transition from a god punishment which dedicated to fighting demons to experiencing a vibrant world capable of being a human again had understandably left Phyllis feeling ambivalent. Yet, she suppressed these emotions for the sake of her comrades in Takira and her obsession with battling demons. Roland admired her dedication and, with a smile, suggested that there might be a chance to return there in the future. He decided to continue experimenting and prepared a makeshift bed in the main hall with the soldiers standing guard by the door. Phyllis sitting next to him, blushed slightly as she looked at Roland, who also felt a bit embarrassed as he closed his eyes. After a while, Roland fell asleep, and their light pillars merged once again. Back in the dream world, it was still nighttime, and Roland found someone lying beside him. Phyllis suddenly opened her eyes, incredulous at the sight before her. Seeing Roland smiling at her, she couldn't help but throw herself into his arms, 
tears of joy streaming down her face. At this moment, the distinction between dreams and reality seemed irrelevant to her. What mattered was that after centuries of suffering and duty, she was finally able to enjoy life. Once Phyllis calmed down, she stepped back, knelt on one knee, and pleaded with Roland to allow her to share this news with the rest of the Takira witches, promising that they would forever remember Roland's kindness and serve him with utmost loyalty. Faced with this earnest request, Roland didn't respond immediately. He was a bit worried about how little Zero might react if she grew suspicious, it would be pretty hard to explain why over a hundred witches came over to their home. Could he really pass them all off as relatives? Given that little Zero was the second creator of the dream world, there was no telling how she might react. If Roland truly intended to bring the Takira witches into this world, he realized he'd need to find a place for them to live. However, this wasn't Neverwinter, and he didn't have that much money. A moment of silence led Phyllis to think that Roland was rejecting her request, she then knelt on both knees, her forehead touching the ground as she tearfully pleaded with Roland. Noticing her misunderstanding, Roland quickly clarified he was actually pondering over where to settle the Takira witches. Upon hearing this, Phyllis's eye sparked and smiled again. Not long after, they found themselves back in Neverwinter with the sunrise just breaking. Eager to share the good news, Phyllis rushed out of the main hall to tell the other Takira witches. Roland had already considered that the witches entering the dream world wouldn't be god punishment witches but actual witches who could truly use their abilities. With their help, exploring the dream world might become more efficient. Still quite tired, Roland yawned and slowly returned to the bedroom and took Anna back into his arms. Anna mumbled, questioning why Roland woke up so early. Roland mentioned he had encountered some issues in the dream world. Curled up against Roland's chest, Anna asked if he had a good dream, to which Roland smiled and said it was a good dream for everyone. He then explained what happened to Anna, who was genuinely happy to hear that the Takira witches could finally return to their real bodies in the dream realm. She then looked at Roland with a playful smile, teasingly asking if he felt guilty, given how beautiful those witches must be. Roland began to deny it, but Anna playfully covered his mouth, laying on his chest, she sensed a bit of guilt and concern, probably because Phyllis must be a very beautiful witch. Hearing this, Roland didn't want Anna to overthink it. Caught in an awkward moment, Anna chuckled while telling him she was joking, insisting that there was no need to have any concerns. Anna said Roland was the king, knowing that he was committed to helping everyone, just as he had helped Anna and the witch association before. Anna did not want to restrict Roland from doing anything but also expressed her wish for him to continue sharing his experiences of the dream world with her. Roland nodded in agreement, and Anna showed a content smile, slowly climbing onto him, while gently biting his collar. Cough cough, alright folks, I know none of you want to see what happens next, so I'll just leave it off here. Moving on, on the other side, when Phyllis brought back the astonishing news, the Takira witches were abuzz with excitement. Some were thrilled at the prospect of regaining their sense of touch and smell, while others were eager to taste foods like hamburgers and pizza. The witches gathered around Phyllis, all talking at once, until Pasha calmed everyone down, joking that with so many of them heading towards the castle together, it might look as if they were planning to attack Neverwinter. Alethea, leaning on Pasha, questioned whether this could be a trap set by the mortal king. Pasha let out a sigh followed by a wry smile, suggesting that even if it were a trap, most of them would still be willing to take the chance. Alethea, slightly irritated, insisted that Phyllis would never deceive them, though whether Phyllis herself had been deceived by Roland was another matter. Pasha decided to send a few to verify the truth, as the offer seemed too good to be true. She looked at Phyllis, asking if the king truly intended to allow them all into that world. Phyllis nodded but clarified not immediately, explaining that the other world had its own rules and to avoid unnecessary disruptions, Roland wished to initially allow only the selective few to join him. The plan would gradually expand to include more of them. Hearing this, Pasha felt more reassured, if Roland was really setting up a trap then he would likely aim to lure as many as possible, however, this clearly wasn't the case. They then learned that Roland was in need of witches with agility, infiltration, control, and offensive capabilities. Alethea frowned while wondering why Roland needed these types of witches as he trying to take over the world? Phyllis, somewhat sheepishly, explained that Roland did not need them to take over the world but rather to undertake some clandestine looting operations targeting criminals. 
the room fell into a brief silence. Alethea grew angrier, couldn't believe Roland intended to use them as muscle. But her complaint was drowned out by the uproar of excitement from the others, none of them seemed concerned and even found the idea intriguing, they all began to tell Phyllis about their various abilities. Pasha, trying to soothe the visibly upset Alethea, reassured her that it's been way too long and everyone was just excited to finally experience a normal life. Once again, Roland returned to the dream world. Little Zero was dressed and ready for school, backpack slung over her shoulder, while Roland had just gotten up from the couch and started stretching. Little Zero, somewhat discontent, pointed out that despite Roland claiming he was going to look for a job, he seemed to spend all his days at home. Roland scratched his head and dismissed her concerns with a comment about her being too young to understand. Little Zero gave him a disdainful look, and then Roland stood up, excitedly declaring his job involved leading a team in technological breakthroughs and exploring territories unknown to mankind. Little Zero, even more skeptical, pouted and turned to leave, all the while sarcastically suggesting he go back to sleep since dreams have everything he could wish for. Roland, with a chuckle, mentioned he'd be working late tonight and tasked Little Zero with preparing her own dinner. She snorted in response and headed out. So what happened recently? Well, we got to go back in time, exactly, three days prior, the Takara witches had already sent volunteers into this world. Their worries and doubts lasted only about a day before being completely dispelled by the news that followed. Everything Phyllis had told them was true. The god punishment witches were so overwhelmed with joy around Roland, some kneeling, others hugging him tightly, and a few even kissing him, unable to contain their happiness. Subsequently, all the Takira witches swore loyalty to him, acknowledging him as their sole leader. And, today marked the first day of action for their dream exploration team. Roland got dressed and left the apartment then walked for a while before arriving at an abandoned warehouse that served as their base of operations, which had nearly drained all of Roland's money. Upon sliding the curtain door open, he was greeted by the aroma of food. Inside, he found several witches gathered around a table, savoring instant noodles as if they were eating the best food in the world, some even licking the seasoning packets clean. Watching this scene, Roland felt embarrassed for them. Followed by tapping everyone on the head, he then inquired about the surveillance on their target from a witch named Faldi. One of the witches stood up and reported that everything was proceeding normally. Faldi possessed exceptional reconnaissance abilities, utilizing small insects to scout areas. Although they couldn't provide visual feedback, they were capable of detecting magical energies or the natural forces of this world. Roland was quickly able to distinguish between martial fighters and those fallen to corruption. They had identified six targets, one of which resided in the luxury villa, making it their primary focus. Since it's a robbery, Roland naturally chose the more rich area ensuring no one would trace them down. The five of them let out a deceptive smile before heading out. Glancing at his watch, Roland decided to take a taxi to their destination, causing some confusion among the witches, one of whom initially thought he meant a carriage. Phyllis patiently explained to them what a taxi was. Observing the group, Roland couldn't help feeling like he was taking kids on a spring trip. After getting off the taxi, the group ventured into the nearby woods and quickly located the villa. Another which then employed her ability to summon a lightless veil, enveloping the group and rendering them invisible to the naked eye. This remarkable ability made everyone within the veil's coverage disappear from sight, pretty much invisible. But its utility extended far beyond mere invisibility, also masking sense and magical energy. They easily bypassed the guards and soon arrived at the largest villa, leaving Roland somewhat envious, given his recent budget only able to afford instant noodles for the witches. Approaching the surveillance system, the third witch took action. Her body seemingly sank into the ground, revealing her ability to merge into any shadow, especially under the cover of night, allowing her to infiltrate the villa with ease and unlock the main entrance for the rest. Once inside, Faldi detected someone in the living room with a strong magical energy. Roland turned to Phyllis, questioning her ability to handle the situation. Phyllis confidently asserted that as long as they weren't dealing with a high-ranked demon, she and Ling could easily manage. The group then proceeded into the villa, the room was cold, and seemed to be air-conditioned but it had an awful smell. They noticed a man in a suit standing motionless in the center of the hall. 
As they cautiously approached him from behind, Roland's eyes caught sight of a huge monster statue hanging in front of the man. The eccentric tastes of the wealthy, Roland mused before they swiftly moved to action. As Phyllis and Ling launched their attack, the enemy turned around but was swiftly bisected by Phyllis before he could react. Ling, hiding in the shadows, questioned if that was all. Roland, covering his nose, noticed the air seemed to grow more putrid, questioning the witches if they remembered what he had taught them about what items to take and what to leave behind. Ling emerged, recalling Roland's instructions to only take gold jewelry, cash, and safe contents while leaving behind other gems that would be difficult to sell. As Roland bent down to extract the natural force from the suit-clad man, Faldi suddenly frowned, she could still sense the magical reaction lingering. Her gaze then fell upon the statue, suddenly her pupils contracted, and she yelled out that the statue was alive. As she finished speaking, the statue abruptly opened its mouth wide and lunged at Roland. Without hesitation, Phyllis stepped in front of him while Roland grabbed her waist and rolled aside to dodge the attack. The monster then flew towards the corpse consumed the natural core and began to speak, saying how happy he was to see the feast delivered to its doorstep. It then spat out a beam, the force of which wrecked the hall and sent the witches crashing to the ground. Roland, using his natural force, shielded them, realizing the creature's magical power was near that of a high-ranking demon. The monster sneered, after hearing being called a demon. It coldly stated that they had stolen power from the divine realm without permission and now dared to label their pursuer as a demon, calling them foolish. Roland didn't understand what the creature meant and had no time to ponder as the massive beast approached him. Suddenly, a streak of black light leaped from the shadow behind the monster, stabbing its eye with a dagger. The figure disappeared back into the shadows upon landing. The dagger remained in the monster's eye, however, the monster appeared unharmed, even mocking them having no idea how important the divine realm really is. As the creature began to glow, its body started to crack and disintegrate. When it finally revealed its true form, Roland was left in shock. He loudly demanded to know who the monster's master was. The creature responded saying his master was beyond Roland's comprehension. Suddenly, it flew up into the air, radiating a red light, clearly intent on preventing anyone from escaping. In an instant, the floors, walls, and ceiling of the hall turned blood red, and Ling was forcibly ejected from the shadows, landing on Phyllis. Faldi stared in disbelief as tentacles emerged from the ground, immobilizing the witches. Gathering his strength, Roland charged at the monster, the monster was surprised to see Roland unaffected. It launched another beam at him, sending Roland crashing into a wall with a forceful blow. Phyllis looked on in concern as Roland coughed up blood but reassured her that he was okay. As Roland slowly stood up, something seemed to gather at his feet, drawing nearby magical energies towards him. Which made the creature stunned. Then, with a powerful leap, Roland shot toward the enemy like a cannonball, and scathed by another beam the monster fired, thanks to the protective energy surrounding him. The next moment, Roland appeared right in front of the creature and punched, his arm penetrating the monster and grabbing a spherical object inside. The creature let out a deafening roar, screaming and yelling out why Roland possessed the power of its master. Then, a dazzling blue light enveloped Roland, turning the red sphere inside the monster blue. Suddenly, an eye appeared on the monster's head, and at this very moment, the monster realized that Roland was the person who created this world and affected its master. Looking at the monster disdainfully, Roland listened as the creature continued, saying Roland knew nothing. Despite its master being invincible, he cannot stop all of this. The monster's voice weakened, pleading with Roland not to return, as Roland's presence was destroying everything. All beings would perish. Roland wasn't bothered by the monster's words, rather he believed that the world would be better off without these demonic creatures. The creature's voice began to fade, its words becoming incomprehensible, but Roland thought he heard something about an abyssal realm and rules before it completely disintegrated. As the creature uttered its final words, it transformed into a beam of energy that shot up into the sky. He then checked on the witch's injuries. Although he was unsure of what just happened, he took the opportunity to retrieve the key from the corpse and secure a safe. Together with the witches, they quietly left the villa.